Hello, let's talk about spherocytosis and hemolytic anemia. Patient walks into your office and this is their only real noticeable physical exam finding. What's your diagnosis? Mine would be hemolytic anemia until proven otherwise, because the only thing that can cause scleral icterus is an elevated unconjugated bilirubin in the blood, also known as indirect bilirubin. And unconjugated bilirubin chiefly comes from the metabolism of porphyrin, which is a constituent of hemoglobin. So when you have widespread lysing of red blood cells, then there's a lot of unconjugated bilirubin resulting downstream from that. Now, to understand hemolytic anemias, we need to take a look at the spleen, which is a reticuloendothelial organ, meaning that it filters your blood and passes over it with a fine tooth comb to take out any pathogens that might be in your bloodstream. The cells responsible for that are B and T lymphocytes localized to the white pulp, which is also called your periarteriolar lymphatic sheath. And then you have the red pulp of the spleen in which there really aren't any lymphocytes. There's just a lot of red blood cells, hence the name. Here's another look at the spleen in which you can see both the white pulp circled in yellow and the red pulp in green on the same slice. And inside the red pulp is where you find the sinuses or the cords of the spleen. You might heard them referred to as cords of Billroth. And that's where a lot of macrophages are. And macrophages populate the red pulp of the spleen in order to pat down red blood cells and yank them out of circulation if there's a membrane defect of those red blood cells, or perhaps if they've been opsonized by IgG or C3B. Those are opsonins, which can stick on the membrane of a red blood cell. And when a macrophage sees it, it says, you're done for, buddy. And here's a closer look at the cords of Bill Roth. The spleen, again, is a sinusoid organ, like the liver, it means it's got these very tight spaces. And between these sinusoids are cords consisting predominantly of macrophages with some endothelial cells there as well. And when red blood cells get snatched up by macrophages of the spleen or when they get stuck in these sinusoids because they do get very, very narrow in places, those blood cells are going to pop and their contents will just get swept up, vacuumed up by macrophages. So here's the end product of this, hemosiderin-laden macrophages, because what's inside red blood cells? A whole bunch of hemoglobin. And hemoglobin, every single one, has four iron molecules. So that's a lot of iron in those macrophages. You can break down the proteins. You can get some amino acids back. You can break down the carbohydrates of a dead red blood cell, and you can get some acetyl-CoA or some pyruvate back from that, from the carbons, but you can't break down the iron. There's no easy way to get it out. So it accumulates inside the macrophages of the spleen, and this is what any hemolytic anemia would look like if you cut the spleen open and looked at it under a microscope. Now, a lot of different ways to classify hemolytic anemia. One way that we do so is by calling it intrinsic or extrinsic. Now that's in reference to the erythrocyte. An intrinsic hemolysis occurs when there's something wrong with the red blood cell itself. There's a problem with its hemoglobin or a problem with its membrane, or maybe it's overload, overloaded with oxidative stress and that's causing it to hemolyze. An extrinsic hemolysis means there's nothing wrong at all with the red cell. It's just kind of in the wrong place at the wrong time. Maybe it was just going out for a run, you know, like hello liver, you know, like hello aorta, hello kidneys, like saying hi to all its friends, internal, external iliac, like down to the popliteal and then bang, get stuck with complement C3B, 
or maybe it gets stuck with an IgG and it goes, oh, I am in big trouble because it knows that whenever it goes around the body and back to the spleen, it's dead. It's dead. It's as easy as that because the macrophages of the spleen, again, are going to see whatever's on the surface of that red blood cell and snap it up and rip it open. So that's an extrinsic hemolysis. And another example would be calcified aortic valve. You're a red blood cell. There's nothing wrong with you. You go through the heart, you know, you're in the right chamber. You go through the lungs. Oh, wee, this is fun. Then you go into the left atrium. You're in the left ventricle and then bang, out like a light. You're dead. So here's a table showing you intrinsic versus extrinsic. And there's a lot less intrinsic hemolyses than there are extrinsic. So I'd say remember the intrinsic ones. Everything else is extrinsic. General features of hemolytic anemia. You've got an elevated erythropoietin. You've got anemia. Your EPO is going to be high. That's a hormone made by interstitial cells of the kidneys. And you're going to have a reticulocytosis reflecting an adequate bone marrow response. It is normal for red blood cells to get phagocytosed by the spleen, in the spleen rather, whenever they are of a certain age, and that's about 120 days, four months. Age-dependent changes in red cell surface proteins lead to their recognition and phagocytosis. Hemoglobin is not released in plasma whenever red blood cells are naturally phagocytosed due to their old age. Again, where's the hemoglobin go? The macrophages eat it all. So that right there, to tie it back to what we just talked about or to what we're about to talk about, you see hemoglobin in the plasma, you know it's an intravascular hemolysis. Red blood cells are popping open before they even get to the spleen. That's the only thing that would give you hemoglobin in the plasma. So an intravascular hemolysis is in the bloodstream and an extravascular hemolysis takes place in the spleen. The macrophages just say, uh, hey, hey, can you come with me real quick? And then no more red blood cell. So it's extravascular. And this is another way we classify hemolytic anemia is based on where it's occurring. Good cartoon here. I wrote down a note that again, any opsonized red blood cell is going to get popped by a macrophage and IgG is an opsonin. And C3B is the most opsonizing of any complement. It's the one complement that's going to stick to stuff and won't come off until that cell has been phagocytosed. And also, red blood cells that get stuck in the spleen, such as spirocytes, that's where we're going next, they're just going to accumulate an acidosis because they'll run out of glucose, and then the macrophages will notice this sickly acidotic blood cell that just can't get out and they'll just snap it up and eat it too so that normal traffic can continue. Macrophages are pretty good about keeping things regulated. What I want to point out about this chart is, well, first of all, what is this? It's the flow of bilirubin and bilirubin, unconjugated bilirubin comes from hemolysis and then your liver grabs that unconjugated bilirubin and with glucuronic acid conjugates that and then puts it out through the bile duct into the small intestine where bacteria further play with that bilirubin to create urobilinogen and stercobilinogen. And what I want to point out to you is that urobilinogen and stercobilinogen are the same exact thing. It just so happens that not all stercobilinogen goes out in feces. Some of it gets reabsorbed into the body, goes through the portal vein, and eventually leaves the body through the kidney. So if you pee it out, we're going to call it urobilinogen. But if you poop it out, we're going to call it stercobilinogen. Same thing, two different names based on how it's leaving the body. It's just conjugated bilirubin that's been manipulated one extra time in the gut. Then the SDL is talking about extravascular hemolysis, which takes place in the spleen. And the text notes that extreme changes in shape are required for red cells to navigate the splenic sinusoids successfully. Now, 
I Googled some stuff, found out that your average red blood cell is about six microns in diameter. And to make it through the spleen, this red blood cell has to contort itself so as to fit through a hole that is about two microns in diameter. So it's really got to get skinny. And if it can't do that because there's a problem with its membrane, then it's going to get stuck and macrophages take it out of circulation. That's an extravascular hemolysis. Now, if this happens enough, you're going to get some degree of splenomegaly. Think traffic jam, think backup, right? It's going to engorge because there's going to be so many obstructed sinusoids and such a degree of hemolysis that the spleen will just swell with edema. This is why many different pathologies, including the two in this SDL, spherocytosis and sickle cell anemia, benefit from splenectomy. Think about it. Why? Well, if every time your red blood cells go around the body, they keep getting stuck in the spleen, it's better for you to not have a spleen and to risk infections that come along with that than it is for you to require blood transfusions every week or two weeks of your life because you keep running out of blood cells. And furthermore, there's that risk of acute splenic crisis. If you ever get hit, it can rupture and you don't want that happening either. So the safest thing to do in the long term is to just take that spleen out. We talk about intravascular hemolysis a little bit usually due to direct trauma. Again, the aortic valve is going to be the number one cause of that. And if you have an intravascular hemolysis, you've got hemoglobinemia. Because one more time, macrophages pick up all that hemoglobin. If it's extravascular hemolysis, but not so if it occurs in the bloodstream, you also see a hemoglobinuria. It's got to get out of the body somehow. One more finding of intravascular hemolysis is a decreased blood haptoglobin. Haptoglobin is a protein that complexes with hemoglobin in order to recycle it because you don't want to waste any hemoglobin. You want to reuse it if you can. So haptoglobin will take hemoglobin and return it to a macrophage where eventually it'll find its way back into a red blood cell. So you have a certain amount of haptoglobin in the blood normally. And if there's hemolysis, hemoglobin goes up, haptoglobin goes down because it complexes with hemoglobin. And another reason you don't want free hemoglobin is because the Fenton reaction is the interaction of iron with hydrogen peroxide. That can create a superoxide, I'm sorry, a hydroxyl radical, OH dot, right? Hydroxyl radical. That happens when there's a lot of free iron. You want to avoid that. And so your body has this haptoglobin system. Erythropoietin always goes up in anemia, unless you're in chronic kidney disease. And the cells that secrete erythropoietin are interstitial fibroblasts of the juxtaglomerular apparatus, not endothelial cells of any part of the kidney. And I bring that up because uh, that's in first aid, actually, in the segment of kidney endocrine functions. They want you to know the types of cells that make these different hormones. So recognize for EPO, it is interstitial cells. You can also get hemosiderosis from a chronic hemolytic anemia. And that's the state of having too much iron in the blood. Furthermore, with a chronic hemolytic anemia, you will start making blood cells in the liver. And this is called extramedullary hematopoiesis. This is pretty cool. Here's your liver. You see hepatocytes with 
some sinusoids in between them because like the spleen, it's a reticuloendothelial sinusoid organ. And right here, you see some small, dark, round cells that are reticulocyte precursors. Clinical presentation of any hemolytic anemia, patient is pale, patient is cold. So pale, why? Heme is a pigment, less heme, less pigmentation, as well as cold, why? You need oxygen to generate heat through your electron transport chain, less oxygen, less heat. Fatigue, same thing there, hypoxia, Dizziness, same thing there. Hypoxia to the tissues of the brain. Jaundice is another key physical exam finding. Can be in the eyes. That's the first place you'll see it is that scleral icterus. And then it'll present in areas of thin skin first. And splenomegaly. So that's hemolytic anemia. Let's discuss hereditary spherocytosis, a particular kind of hemolytic anemia. It's hereditary and its inheritance is usually autosomal dominant. Key findings in spherocytosis include splenomegaly every single time. You're always going to see splenomegaly in a spherocytosis because the spherocytes get stuck in those small little two micron sinusoids they can't get through they're inflexible why because they're spherocytes you can imagine what that looks like it's literally a cell that is a sphere so it can't change its shape it's only got one shape it's stuck in circle mode because you always have a splenomegaly and you always have an anemia you always have an unconjugated bilirubinemia which is going to lead to some brown pigmented gallstones given enough time. So these patients often have a history of gallbladder disease or episodes of jaundice. And finally, one last thing you wanna know about spherocytosis right off the bat, you diagnose it with the osmotic fragility test. This is a pretty particular test for spherocytosis. There's not much else we use it for. So that's kind of entering into buzzword territory there. What's the gist of it? Inflexible cells get stuck in the two micron cords of Billroth and they get snapped up by macrophages of the spleen and phagocytosed. It's a heritable defect in membrane proteins of the red blood cell. And out of this table at the bottom of page seven, uh, this one column with the names of the proteins is really all you got to know for now. Spectrin is a protein specific to red cells. They have a specialized cytoskeleton that is flexible. Most cells, you want a rigid cytoskeleton. They just have to stay in one place, like bone or your liver, any organ with a capsule or a serosa. It's got to have some structure to it, but not the erythrocyte. You want it to be like water, like Bruce Lee, right? Like water. You want it to just go with the flow, literally. So you've got this special protein called spectrin right on the inside of the red blood cell that enables it to be like water. And spectrin is connected to the phospholipid bilayer membrane via anchorin. Anchorin is the protein that's most commonly responsible for spherocytosis and spectrin has a beta and an alpha unit and both of those may be out and are possible causes of spherocytosis. So what happens is that with membrane instability, you just kind of bleb off little bits and the membrane of the cell gets so depleted to where it has to adopt a spherical shape because that's the most efficient way to fit any object in three dimensions is a sphere. 
So it becomes a sphere automatically. And then again, it gets stuck in the spleen, phagocytosed. There's your hemolytic anemia. Again, these are usually autosomal dominant, unless it is the very severe type, which tends to be autosomal recessive. And what kind of mutations are we talking about? Frame shifts and premature stop codons, such that the mutated allele fails to produce any protein at all. So total loss of function. Clinical presentation again, you'll have splenomegaly every single time. You'll have cholelithiasis almost every single time. Scleralicturus, very common first presentation. A couple of complications of this spherocytosis anemia. Transfusions are often necessary on a consistent basis, depending on the degree of anemia. And anytime you transfuse something into a patient, there's a risk of a transfusion related infection subsequently. Possibly a minor degree of hemolysis could also result from a transfusion because, you know, we type and cross match for a lot of different antigens on the surface of red blood cells, but we don't know every single protein on the red blood cell. And so there's always the possibility that some tiny little dude that we don't even know about yet can cross react. Splenectomy does treat the anemia. You won't be popping up, open these spherocytes anymore, but if you take the spleen out, the spleen is in charge of yanking encapsulated bacteria out of the blood because, well, I'll show you rather than tell you. Remember these periarterial or lymphatic sheaths of the white pulp of the spleen. There's a ton of B lymphocytes in there that can turn into a plasma cell at a moment's notice and start making some IgM, which is very good at phagocytosing encapsulated bacteria. So, Strep pneumo, most common encapsulated bacteria. We also have Haemophilus in this area, correct? And then a plastic crisis is just gonna make any anemia worse. That's any anemia, not just spherocytosis. And that's typically mediated by parvovirus B19, single-stranded, smallest DNA virus, naked virus, torches infection, rash starts on the face and moves down, fever, arthralgias and joint pain, and possibly even bone necrosis. So we diagnose spherocytosis with the osmotic fragility test. And red cells burst in hypotonic solution. That means there's less solute outside the cell than inside the cell. So water moves inside the cell. So if any old red cell will burst in a hypotonic solution, well, then a cell with less membrane is going to be able to accommodate less water. Therefore, the cell with less membrane bursts before the normal red blood cell. And that's what we see in this graph here on page 10. And that's the extent to which I'm gonna learn about the osmotic fragility test. There's also the Eosin-5 malamide binding test, which is highly specific and sensitive for identifying hereditary spherocytosis. Here is, uh, this is pretty cool, actually. This is results of a osmotic fragility test. And as you can see, uh, you're gonna put blood samples in varying concentrations of saline and the patient with spherocytosis, their blood sample starts popping. You can see uh, some clouding up of that sample at 0.85 uh, concentration sodium chloride. So the more hypotonic you get, again, the more water wants to go into the cell. As you can see, normal cells 
you can visibly see the hemolysis at a con at a, at a lower concentration of sodium chloride. So it takes a more hypotonic solution to get those normal cells to pop. Finally, splenectomized patients are at risk of sepsis, most commonly strep pneumonia. So right after you take the spleen out, probably a good idea to get these patients the vaccine for streptococcus pneumonia so that they can kind of not worry about that follow-up sequelae. So that's anemias, hemolytic anemias in general, spherocytosis. I'll talk about sickle cell disease another time. Thank you very much.